Thank you, Philippe, and uh, thank you, uh, Jules and Pascal, for this absolutely wonderful conference, and of course, the Academy for having uh, started all this. So I am a plant ecologist and a chemist, and I've been spending um, pretty much three decades trying to understand how this particular plant uh, lives in the real world. Um, it's a native plant and uh, developed a Max Planck Institute that uh, has a department that's focused on trying to understand uh, what makes it survive. And what I want to do in this talk is to try to convince you that one of the best ways of understanding plants is to understand the herbivores that feed on it and the predators that feed on those herbivores. Um, so I want to tell you what these five insects have told us and how insects really are some of the best uh, plant biologists on the planet. And I want to say a few words about the plant from the beginning because it's a native plant, you've never heard about it, um, uh, and it is a fire chaser. And because it chases fires in ecologic time, um, it basically grows in the agricultural niche, which is why it's an interesting one to study because we could then therefore learn how to make our, our crop plants a lot more ecologically sophisticated. Um, so what we've been doing for the past uh, couple decades has been to take uh, various sorts of metabolic and ecological phenotyping and genetic approaches toward understanding this problems of living in the real world for a plant. And of course, we want to have developed a nice unbiased approach toward all three of those approaches. Um, and we have indeed uh, a strongly unbiased metabolomics approach and a strongly unbiased uh, ecological phenotyping approach, but our genetic approaches has been severely biased. Um, and that's largely because uh, we haven't had a genome. So in the past two decades, we've been asking the plant, querying the plant's transcriptome, querying the plant's metabolome and its proteome uh, to find out what happens in various sorts of ecological circumstances when it's pollinated, when it's eaten by various herbivores, um, and thereby getting ideas about genes that we should be studying uh, in, the, in the particular interactions. And then, of course, we uh, use RNAi to knock out that particular gene, uh, transform the plants, um, and take those plants out to our field station in Utah. So we do all the genetic engineering in Germany, and we do all the field releases in the United States, uh, which uh, makes that possible to happen. Um, and um, what we've learned uh, after about 550 of these releases is that very frequently the plants don't have a phenotype in the glasshouse, but they have a phenotype and we take them out into our reserve and expose them to all those organisms that interact with them. Because it's the interactors that are significantly better plant phenotypers than we are. These are the ones that after all make a living uh, feeding on plants and, and living and interacting with them. And they're extremely good at telling us when a particular gene has been knocked out and what the phenotype is for that particular gene. Um, so, uh, what I want to do is tell you what the next 10 years of the department is going to be because we're switching focuses and trying to adopt a forward genetics approach. And of course, forward genetics is the, the perfect sort of gold standard. We've heard a number of examples of, of genetic screens that have just been uh, invaluable in understanding how biology works. Um, and that forward genetics approach has, of course, been... Um, a, uh, made possible by the fact that we finally have a genome um, for this. And this is the, the group of, of folks who uh, made this genome possible. Um, it was a major effort because it's a pretty big genome, 2.3 gigabases worth of sequence, 85% of which are uh, repeats from various viral elements uh, challenging the assembly. And um, the plant's particular secondary metabolites thwarted the use of PacBio, the clog, the nanopure uh, technology. So it took us a long time to figure out how to knock out those particular second metabolites and be able to get good long read sequences. Um, and now we have a complete uh, second version of that genome, which is all based entirely on on pack bio sequences where um, basically 95% of the genes have been scaffolded to the, to the plant's 12 chromosomes. So we're ready to, to start to shuffle the deck um, and to, uh, to develop a, a genetic tool to be able to, to utilize in an ecological situation. And um, so we've generated a magic population. Uh, magic, in case you weren't hip to the uh, terms of, of for genetics, stands for a multi-parent advanced generation intercross. Um, and uh, the way we started that magic population was to basically collect um, in one big greenhouse screen the 420-some accessions of, of, of seeds that I've collected over the last 20 years from the Great Basin Desert, grown them in a greenhouse, phenotype them for 50-some um, ecologic traits that were interesting to us, and then from those 
uh, uh, large collection of, of accessions, chose 26 parents that were represented the most extreme phenotypes to do a binary intercross. Um, uh, that took uh, two years, and then four rounds of systemic intercrossing. That was another uh, additional years, and then seven generations of inbreeding, which after nine years, we now have uh, 1,925 real population that we're ready to start doing some interesting ecology with. Um, and uh, if you have been familiar with the sorts of ecological interactions that, that, uh, that we study, you know that we look at very complicated ecological interactions, I interactions that involve herbivores interacting with the plant, uh, eliciting specific responses, the predators that interact with those herbivores, things that happen above ground, below ground. In other words, things that do not readily address themselves to a high throughput screen. And if you know about uh, for genetic screens in plant biology, you recognize that you, there's only simple traits that have been used to screen for, for such, um, in, in such screens, like flowering time, where you can grow a, a whole table full of Arabidopsis and then bend down and phenotype the whole table by just looking at who's flowering and who's not flowering. That's not something you can do with these sorts of ecological interactions. And what I wanted to convince you that by taking a page from the founders of chemical ecology, namely Tom Eisner and Jerry Meinwell, um, and using insect, insect as sentinels, one actually can do high throughput, complicated ecological screening of such large populations. And the five insects I want to uh, introduce to you today who are gonna be our sentinels for this work um, have all popped up here on the screen. And I will go through them one by one to tell you a little bit about what they tell us about with regard to uh, plant function. I want to uh, tell you also that we have been practicing this procedure, trying to uh, revamp our procedures, our ecological screens for the field, with a starter real population, a biparental real population uh, from Utah and Arizona that we planted out in 2017 and 2018. And I'll, pre I'll present a couple of preliminary results from that. And here are the two folks, uh, two group leaders in the, in the department that organized that effort. Um, so the first insect I want to tell you about is a manduka moth that is both a good guy because it's a pollinator, an extremely good nighttime pollinator that is attracted to the floral scent of the plant and utilizes its antenna to identify the plant from long distances and its proboscis and ex particular receptors on the proboscis to guide it into the flower. But it also is a bad guy because it oviposits on the plant, produces this voracious larvae that is the most nicotine tolerant organism in the world and has broken through the plant's major defense, which is nicotine. Um, and uh, this is a, um, an insect that is recognized by the plant from the spit that the caterpillar introduces to a wound as it chews along. So right there, up on that uh, uh, cut leaf edge there, you can see a little green slimy film. And that green slimy film is uh, what we politely call the oral secretions of the caterpillar. Um, and in the oral secretions of the caterpillar are a group of seven fatty acid amino acid conjugates, simply just a fatty acid, uh, 18 carbon, 16 carbon fatty acid is sterified to either glutamate or glutamine. And these are the HAMPs, the elicitors that the plant uses to recognize that is being consumed by Manduca sexta and not one of 11 other Lepidoptera or a number of other insects that attacked it. Uh, Reiko Halechke was the person uh, in, uh, who identified those structures in his, in his thesis. Now, what these elicitors do is that they completely change the plant. They basically result in a reconfiguration of the plant's proteome, its transcriptome, um, its metabolome. The plant produces about 1,500 new transcripts, about 500 new metabolites, um, and then it reorganizes a lot of its uh, physiology in response. That recognition process involves a signaling cascade that has a whole lot of components to it that I could spend hours telling you about. Um, it took many years to identify all these components, but it's basically based on a core part of a jasmate signaling cascade that involves the production of jasmine isoleucine, which will be circled here in red. Um, and the whole purpose of this cascade is to allow the plant to be able to say, I am being attacked by a caterpillar and not by anything else introduced by the caterpillar as it's feeding. Caterpillars, after all, do not brush their mandibles in the morning. Their mouths are full of other bacteria. And those bacteria, of course, would elicit all sorts of inappropriate signaling that would be inappropriate for the plant to respond to when it's being attacked by this voracious caterpillar. 
So this beautiful signaling cascade uh, that recognizes these FACs uh, makes sure that the plant does the right things. And what it does is changes the plant in this interesting six-layered uh, approach. I got an iBiology talk which describes all six layers. I won't go into them. It's a two-hour talk. But I will mention one of those components, which was the component that Christoph just uh, uh, mentioned in his previous uh, talk about cassava mealworm, namely the indirect defenses. Now, the indirect defenses of this plant involve a little predator, a little hemipterum um, bug that attacks the uh, caterpillar and the eggs, um, and is a genitalist predator that feeds by sticking its proboscis into the larvae and killing many of them um, at a time. So unlike a parasitoid that usually will only kill one with each oviposition, it's actually very effective at killing um, many in its lifetime. And the way it works is the caterpillar begins to feed on the plant. The plant um, recognizes these, these FACs as they're introduced into the wounds that the caterpillar chews along. The plant begins to release from not only the attack leaf, but the entire plant, a bouquet of about 140 structures, the same number as in Chanel number five, of which there are a couple key compounds. There's a, a, a sesquiterpene called transalphabergamotine, they're identified in red, which is a long distance uh, uh, cue that attracts the predator from long distances, and then when the predator comes up close to the plant, it utilizes green leafy volatiles. In fact, the change in a particular double bond structure in the green leafy volatiles to locate the exact position of the caterpillar, and then goes up and sticks its bug beak into it and sucks it dry. So it's a beautiful defense response. The plant doesn't have to do anything more than, than attract attention of predators and inform them in an accurate way about the location of an herbivore that's feeding on them. We developed an assay, which was simply an egg gluing assay, which turned out to be a real breakthrough for us for being able to study this phenomena in the field. We simply glue eggs onto the plant. Uh, Danny Kessler and Andre Kessler uh, developed this procedure, and then we let the predators come up and at uh, attack these eggs. As you can see here in the video, it's just sucking them out, and it leaves this nice emptied egg um, as an indicator that tells us a nice quantitative measure of the amount of predation pressure the plant has attacked. And this has allowed us to unravel the various transcription factors that, re that regulate the release of that Chanel number no. five that is the alarm call for this plant. And we've used this uh, predation assay uh, in the real population. So we were able to screen um, 625 different rills um, in Arizona. And we found out that in Arizona, unlike in Utah, where he had done most of the work, the plants actually use a different volatile for the alarm call, a structure that many people know about this monoterpene called linalool. Um, and we were able to get a nice QTL for it, clone the gene, boom, all done in a very high throughput way. Um, um, and we will be using this predator as one of our major screens for uh, this large magic population. Now the nice thing about the spit and the predator response is that one can simply collect enough spit and then use a fabric pattern wheel right up there like you would forget from a dress shop to make holes in leaves and then add the spit to the holes and you can do it in a very high throughput way. And that allows you to to elicit in a very systematic way the thousands of plants that are being part of this real population that we'll be releasing in the next couple of years. Um, these are some shots from the Utah field season um, last year as we were beginning to practice and plant out these plants. Now the second insect I'd like to introduce to you, actually the third insect, um, is a leafhopper, um, an Emboasca leafhopper. Um, and this was a, a, a leafhopper that we discovered as an herbivore only when we released plants that were silenced in the jasmate signaling cascade. We had knocked out the lipoxinase gene there labeled in red, um, X'd out in red, and that made the plants jasmate deficient and unable to elicit this signaling cascade when attacked. And those plants that were defenseless and unable to respond were severely attacked by this leafhopper, which was really the first time we had seen the herbivore in the plant. Um, we discovered later that the leafhopper elicits jasmine signaling by its own feeding activity. It's a slash and feed uh, insect feeder. Um, and that when we went through and put out RNAi lines that were silenced in every step in the jasmine pathway, all the steps that are involved in the, in the, uh, in the, in the plastidial biosynthesis of the cascade, um, in the proxosomal part of it, we uh, produced another jasminate mutant that um, um, converted the jasminic acid to methyl jasminate and inhibited the methyl esterase that transferred it back in. We silenced the receptor for this plant, the koi uh, gene, and we silenced three major defense pathways that are activated by jasminate signaling and planted them all out in a field um, uh, depicted here. And you know 
notice that all the different colored flags in that picture are the different genotypes that we planted into the field. And then at the bottom of the field, you see there's a green alfalfa field. And that alfalfa field is where the embaska normally lived. And then half, when the plants were well grown, we mowed that alfalfa field, drove the embaska up into the field plot, and this is the damage responses that we saw. And you can see from the, the y-axis there that the plants were, that were most heavily damaged were all the ones that were inhibited in jasminate biosynthesis, but not in the responses elicited by jasminate biosynthesis. We still don't know why Emboasca likes to do that, but it turns out that the Emboasca uh, leafhopper is a perfect bloodhound to identify jasminate mutants. And we were able to collect lots of these Emboasca at nighttime. They're, they're quiet, they're collected from cucumber plants and alfalfa plants, and then we ride around on our motorcycles in the, in the desert, finding little populations releasing these emboasca uh, uh, leafhoppers onto plants, and they identify where the Jesuit mutants are um, just by their feeding activity. Um, and we have a number of examples where we've identified natural mutants there. And what we plan to be doing with these large populations is simply releasing emboasca adults on them and letting them screen the many replicates of these 1925 rules to tell us which ones are jasmate deficient. Um, so, um, another herbivore that tells us a lot about the very complicated processes that plant herbivores uh, interact with. The fourth insect I want to tell you about is a little mirrored bug, a mirrored bug which um, uh, attacks the plants. It's a substantially smaller bug. There's an adult here, and uh, I don't know if you can see, there are three nymphs there. So they're fairly small, fairly difficult to, to observe by eye. They also, um, there's a, a size comparison. The manduca larvae would fill up the whole screen in comparison to the, to the little tubiochorus mirid. Um, and tubiochorus also has the, the, the problem that they are nighttime active. So they're like Berlin hipsters. They stay out all night long. You have to have special infrared cameras to be able to measure their, their activities during the day. Um, and um, uh, and they're just basically difficult to work with. And we didn't really understand what mirids cared about until we started to transform plants for cytokinin biosynthesis. And for people who know about cytokinins, there's a very important plant growth hormone that regulates um, uh, growth and development of, of, of lots of plant tissues. Um, the pathway, there's about 20 different cytokinins that, that plants produce. They're complicated, many structures, but the pathway all starts with isopentanyl pyrophosphate, IPT, and if you overexpress the IPT, you can increase cytokinin levels, but you have to do it in a very controlled way. So we put the dex-inducible construct um, to drive it. We were able to plant these dex-inducible IPT plants out in the field, induce particular leaves and particular uh, plants at a particular time, and every time we activated cytokinin by the senses, the local mirids there attacked those particular leaves or those particular plants that were activated. And it turned out that mirids themselves increase cytokinin levels. If you just look at what mirids do when they feed on plants and you collect the leaves that they're feeding on, you find that those leaves are also high in cytokinin levels. The bodies of mirids are full of cytokinins, and then in a complicated N15 labeling experiment, we were able to show that mirids actually transfer cytokinins to the plant while feeding. And what these mirids have done is taken a page from the playbook of endophytic insects. Insects that you may are familiar with, that like the like the the, the petiole galling aphid um, on the right on the left on the right hand picture, or the leaf mining fungi that form those green islands. They're all producing cytokinins to prevent leaves from removing the nutrients that that those herbivores like to feed on, and that's what these free living myriads are doing. They're injecting. Uh, cytokinins into the leaf, increasing the nutritional quality of the area on their feeding, but they're also doing something else that you don't really see until you've removed the cytokinin receptors of the plants. And if you silence the two main cytokinin receptors of the plant, namely HK2 and HK3, um, you'll see that the plants senesce very rapidly because they can't perceive that that cytokinin that the insect is injecting into the plant to suppress the senescence and damage responses that their feeding normally causes. And you can see the leaves there of the cytokinin receptor uh, silence plants are heavily uh, senescent and, and, um, and damaged where the, um, where the insects have been feeding. So again, here is an insect that is telling us about some very complicated manipulations of plant physiology that they themselves do, and we plan to be using them as a major screen for this large um, uh, magic population that we'll be releasing. 
the last insect that I want to tell you about uh, requires a little more introduction. It's a weevil that oviposits when the plants are just beginning to elongate their stems. And uh, the egg uh, moves into the stem of those plants and then goes through four instars and turns into this beautiful adult that you'll see on the other side. We plan to be using this weevil as a, as a sentinel of microbiome-induced defenses in this particular plant, and I need to explain this in a little bit more detail. It took us a while to realize how important microbes are for plants, and we were sort of a come-lately, a born-again microbiologist. Um, we learned it the hard way uh, by studying our own plant, which was getting infected by a fungal disease, um, and we realized that we were thwarting a very important microbe recruitment process that plants normally had by germinating all our plants on petri dishes, something that APHIS, the organization that regulates transgenic plants in the United States, required us to do. When we did that, we were thwarting this process that plants normally did when they germinate. They recruit their uh, microbiome from the soil, taking up particular tax of a micro microbes that were very important in protecting themselves against fungal diseases. And it turned out, this is some work we, pu we published in, in PNAS a few years ago, that there are five bacterial taxa that the plant has to recruit, otherwise it looks like the plant to the left there in the picture instead of the plant on the right. I hope I got that right. Yeah, the green one. Um, so the green one has been able to recruit the microbiome. The, the one on the left was not allowed to recruit the microbiome and has, been, has succumbed to fungal attack. It turns out this weevil seems to be doing exactly the same thing. Weevils, because they are trapped inside the stem, have to make do with they're getting through the entire life cycle by eating the pith of the plant and not eating anything more than just the pith of the plant. So they go up and down the pith, recycling their frass, becoming coprophagic, and making sure they extract every bit of nutrient out of, the, out of that frass as they eat along. If you sterilize the weevils or sterilize their frass, they simply don't survive. So a, a weevil that has uh, an egg with the normal microbiome that's laid with will produce a very healthy adult at the end. If you sterilize the egg before you introduce it into the plant, it's, it succumbs to fungal attack. So we're very interested in the process of how does the plant bring in those entomopathogenic fungi that they use clearly for defense against weevils. Um, and we plan to be using eggs from Trichobarus, either sterilized or not sterilized, as a major screen for these microbial defenses um, in the plant. So um, when does a plant accumulate these particular and recruit those particular uh, fungi that they use for defenses, um, and how do they maintain them and so forth are, are questions that we hope to be able to get genetic answers to. So I hope I've convinced you that by being able to utilize insects that naturally attack plants, one can get enormously valuable information about the sophistication of plants and be able to use them for high throughput screens that allow you to drive for genetic experiments. Ecologists have not been very successful in identifying the genetic basis of the very complicated uh, traits that plants clearly do and manage in their genomes. We hope in this, in this uh, decade from now, in the, the last part of my uh, career at the Max Planck Society, to be able to understand the genetic basis for the integration of processes such as complicated as the recruitment of the beneficial fungi and bacteria, microbes, dealing with herbivores, and what I haven't told you about is the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi that they also interact with. And being able to manage all this complexity is something that plants do all the time, but one has to develop genetic screens to be able to take them apart. And this is what we hope to be doing in, in these settings. Now, um, uh, field work is great because it allows you to, to, to parse that complexity, but field work also has a downside to it. Um, this is a, a little movie I took on Saturday at the field station where I just came from. And um, uh, my field station used to be here. Um, and on uh, Friday night, uh, we had a major flood that came through and washed the whole thing out. And that's what it looks like now. Now, um, this is a field station in the United States, so this, of course, has nothing to do with climate change. Um, <laughs> but uh, one thing that we can be sure about is that 
uh, whenever we get it rebuilt, um, the insects will be back and we'll be able to have our, our, our entomological screeners um, to help us work through um, these interesting experiments. And I hope I've convinced you in this short synopsis that if you want to understand a plant, you have to ask an insect. Um, I have a number of people I need to acknowledge, the Max Planck Society for funding the ERC, but most importantly, Brigham Young University, who owns and operates this nature preserve that we do our field releases, um, and then a number of people for photographs. And thank you for your attention. If there is time for a couple of questions. Yes? Hi, Ian. Um, thank you for such a passionate talk. My question is about the myriad insects. Um, how do you think they uh, sequester, store, and then release the cytokinin into their target plants? Excellent question. And we uh, tried to look at the symbionts to see whether or not they were um, bacterially synthesized, and we didn't really come to a, a clear conclusion about that. Um, these myriads are very hard to grow aseptically. We can do it for about three instars, but we can't do it for a full generation. Um, so it was not, a, not an experiment that we could, um, we could give a, a, a clean answer to. So I can, all I can say is we don't know. But we do know from this N15 labeling experiment that they're synthesized definitely in the insect and transferred into the plant. Yeah. And about 20% of the cytokinin levels in a plant at the time of a feeding comes from the insect. So it's a lot. And a question? Thanks for a wonderful talk, Ian. Uh, and I was intrigued by the, by the weevil uh, story that you mentioned. And I wondered to what extent is host plant quality, and uh, so nicotine or, or other secondary metabolites, involved in uh, the, the response of, of the weevil where it needs the microbiome? That's a really interesting question, and that's something that we're just be at the beginning stages of understanding the weevil's microbiome. We do know that um, there are two species of weevils. This was uh, Trichobarus mucrea. Uh, there's another one, uh, Trichobarus compacta, which is completely nicotine sensitive, will accidentally oviposit on this plant and kill their larvae when they do so. It lives on datura, which produces scopolamine, other alkaloids, but it does, is totally nicotine free. So. Um, it's likely to be, this nicotine resistance is likely to be a recently evolved um, uh, trait and uh, something that we hope to explore. It's a, we don't really know if the microbiome is playing a role in it, but it's an interesting hypothesis. Any more questions? No? So thank, thank you again for this talk.